Six months ago, I began working on an ecosystem simulation game. I honestly don't know where to begin. But the inspiration for this whole adventure started with this single individual. This is Charles Darwin. In 1835, he sailed on the HMS Beagle to the Galapagos Islands to document observations of the surrounding ecosystem. What he found there was rather shocking and completely transformed traditional beliefs. You've most likely seen this image somewhere already. It's a famous illustration of the finches Darwin observed on the different islands in the Galapagos. Now, what I want you to do is instead of focusing on the birds, I want you to think of the overarching system. What caused the finches' unique beak shape? Well, that's a simple question. It's really just what they ate. The beak shape was specialized for the food the finches ate, like the insect-eating finches or the seed-eating ones. Now, what caused the environment's unique characteristics? This question is a lot harder. One could argue that the insects on the island only colonize in areas not near the semi-arid lava substrates thus making a divide or border between the parts of an island where insects reside. One could also argue that the prevalence of rotten wood due to humid environmental conditions allow mangrove and woodpecker finches to dig out beetles inside the wood using cacti. Nevertheless, this story of the uniqueness and dynamic nature of the ecosystem is what I wanted you to get out of this story. This story shows that each segment of the ecosystem influences each other in significant ways that you didn't even think of. As you could probably tell, I was highly intrigued by this, so I set out to make my own ecosystem simulation game. Excited to start the project, I first created a small test creature that looked like a cube. This creature would be the prototype for the basic mechanics of the simulation. And once I created the creature script, I added a couple lines of code. I placed it on the ground and let it run. As shown, this creature wanders in a random direction and its direction changes every second. After spotting a piece of food, it picks the closest one rotates towards it and devours it. That was a great success, but we're still very far away from making anything like a simulation. Plus, this creature is just a cube. So, let's change that first. Here's what I'm gonna do. Each creature will consist of four parts, a head, neck, torso, and leg. The head will serve as a distinctive identifier. To test multiple creatures, you can use the head shape to analyze different species. Next, the creature's height is influenced by their necks. As an example, if the plant is taller than the creature, the creature will not be able to consume it. And lastly, the creature's torso changes the amount of storage for food. And then there's the legs. For the legs, it's going to be a lot more complicated. I'm going to use something called inverse kinematics to move the legs. Inverse kinematics will allow for an endpoint of an arm to move to a designated position. In the context of humans, when we're walking, we first step forward a known position away from our torso. Then, once our back leg is a distance away from our torso, our back leg becomes our front leg. This cycle repeats and you've got the basic mechanisms for walking. For the game, I can set four target points attached to the torso. Then, I can set a distance to which the leg goes back to the new torso position. And finally, take the average leg Y position and set it as the torso Y position. I know that was a lot, but it finally works. After I finished that, I spent a bit more time putting it all with UI. And now you can select the creature you want. But we're not done here yet. You see, the parts you can see on the creature are actually controlled by genes in the background. What gets shown is the phenotype, and what is behind the physical body is a number, also known as the genotype. For now, I created 8 genes in the form of an array, which gets passed down to the next generation. And here are the genes. After all the genes are ready, then we calculate 3 values. 
first is the energy output, which is mapped by this equation. Next is the total weight. A weight value is associated to each part of the body, after which it's added. Lastly is the total height, which is just the height of the creature. And after a bit of code, here's what it looks like. Now it's time to make some plants for the ecosystem. But before we go any further, I want to talk about something very important. A lot of the time, we assume that the plant population is just there for a food source, so the creatures can compete for it. While this is perfectly okay to show experiments in a controlled manner, it's also a very dangerous assumption. Plant populations can also evolve to resist herbivores, the same way that prey can evolve to resist predators. Oftentimes in the cycle of coevolution, like the name suggests, intertwining populations of species can influence each other, which may lead to a deadly arms race between the two species. One example of this occurring is the lodgepole crossbills relationship. A lodgepole pine is a tree that produces seeds with a hard outer cone. In crossbills, birds who use the seeds inside as a food source. The problem is, it's a conflicting point of interest. If the crossbills successfully eat the seeds, the crossbill population increases. But because the lodgepole pine seed is used to pass life on to the next generation, the crossbill decreases the chance of a lodgepole to successfully reproduce, thus decreasing their population. Over time, if the lodgepole population were not to resist the crossbill's effortless attempts at eating their seeds, they would be extinct. Instead, in the process of natural selection, the lodgepole pines with the thickest seeds were able to survive and reproduce because the crossbills were unable to open the hard shell it was encased in, and thus be able to resist the crossbills' efforts of sealing the seeds. Over time, trees with the thickest seeds would survive and reproduce, and the crossbill population would struggle due to the thicker seeds, resulting in crossbills with larger and stronger beaks to survive and reproduce, which then causes lodgepole pine cone to be even thicker where the cycle continues again. While this is a rather obvious example of co-evolution, what I want you to get off this story is the dynamic nature of the ecosystem in this example. The plants were able to fight back against the herbivores and hold on tenaciously. And this is exactly why I started implementing a more procedural and dynamic system for the plants. The plan is to generate plants the same way we generate creatures previously and allow for some interesting scenarios to play it out between the two. To begin with the plants, I found a handy tool for generating procedural trees and decided to use it. The tool already has 10 values, like recursion level, trunk thickness, and much more. Inspired by the crossbills example, I also decided to add two more genes, seed hardness and seed armor. These two genes are rated on a 0 to 1 scale, 1 being hard and 0 being light. Same with the seed armor. Essentially, the plants will be generated using these parameters as genes, and there are four types of plants, ones with toxic seeds, fruit seeds, hard seeds, and flying seeds, each of which have their drawbacks and advantages. Two values are then calculated, energy consumption and water consumption. The idea is that the wider and taller plant will be able to gain more energy faster, and thus be able to reproduce faster, but take up considerably more resources, and thus need more space on the map. Conversely, a smaller plant will reproduce slower, but be able to cram more plants inside. What we expect to see is logistic growth, where initially, plants will exponentially increase due to the amount of space available, but then start to plateau at the carrying capacity. So I implemented just that, and after a lot of work, we have our first prototype of the editor. Now, I made an editor for both the plants and the animals. I would love to finally start making them interact, but the environment, uh, looks less than pleasing. So, I looked into procedural generation. Procedural generation will allow me to create hills, valleys, and coves with just code. So, I decided to follow a tutorial series on procedural generation by Sebastian Lag and made something like this. Yeah, it, it, it didn't look great, but I promise I fix this later. I then put the animals and the plants together. 
The first problem was to figure out how to actually make the creatures move to the plant, which before was working, but with the new creature, there were a lot of problems. Eventually, I got it to work, and here's how it works. The creature first wanders in a random direction in hopes of finding a plant. When the physical distance between the creature and the plant is less than the look radius, the creature will then move towards the plant. The creature will then fill up its storage with the food from the plant, decreasing the size of the plant. Once the creature is satisfied, as shown in this equation, the creature will then go find a mate. When spotting a mate, the creature will then walk towards each other and have an amount of maximum kids shown in this equation. The child will then take the average of the parent's genes, then mutated by a specific amount specified by the mutation strength and the mutation chance value. Then the creatures will disperse and repeat this cycle. Until a predator appears. A predator will chase the creature when in sight, and when close enough, it'll start attacking the creature. To balance the predators, each creature will have a defense and an attack statistic. The attack statistic favors small and fast creatures, while the defense statistic favors large and heavy creatures. To visualize the attack, prey will lose size over time. Eventually, these two creatures will have to duel it out, where either the predator runs out of energy, or the prey falls and dies. Well, now we figured out that it actually works, so why not test out our simulation? One thing I found super interesting was that every time I ran my simulation, the creatures would either die out, or the look radius and speed would skyrocket. It seemed that the ecosystem selected for super high speed and super high look radii, which made no sense to me, since the energy cost function clearly didn't support that. It turns out the look radius wasn't clamped, so it would cover the entire map. Also, it turned out that the creatures traveled faster when there was a larger look radius, basically inventing teleportation. I was genuinely surprised by this novelty and patched this loophole, but it was still cool to see the simulation show something that you never knew. In other simulations, the gestation would just drop below zero. I never knew this was possible and why it would work in the first place, but after looking at the code, these creatures found a cheat code. In the code, the amount of children reproduced is stored in a for loop. When the maximum offspring is less than zero, the variable i will always be greater, thus pretty much guaranteeing infinite babies. If that happened in real life, uh, that would be pretty problematic. So I fixed these loopholes and the simulation finally worked. But for me, the simulation visuals just aren't cutting it. Like I said before, the procedural terrain is, well, uh, it doesn't look too great. So I decided to give the entire game a visual revamp. Finally, it looks like something that's more visually pleasing. So now the basic rules of the sandbox were finally finished, it was time to run some more in-depth simulations. The first couple hundred simulations were just to test to see how long I could keep the ecosystem running for, with the plants unable to change and the creatures mutable. I've also exported all the data into a CSV, so the data was easier to analyze. Most runs either completely flopped, or the creatures became too powerful, so the plant population died, and the creatures followed soon after. Until about run number 89 when I increased the trunk size a bit larger so the plants could gain energy faster, that I finally got two cycles. Now, let's break down this run. What we should expect to see, according to the Lotka Volterra equations, is something like this. While we do see something like that in the creatures, the plants, uh, not so much. This is because I made the trees logistically increase. The model only works if the rate of change is proportional to the population. We can clearly see this in the herbivores, because as a number of herbivores increase, the easier it is for them to find a mate and reproduce. However, even though there are more plants, if 4-5 to five plants, depending on the statistics, are near each other, the next plant will not have enough energy to reproduce or survive, and thus die. I then ran a bunch more simulations to see if I could get the ecosystem to continue even longer. And after more than 20 runs, run number 115, 
I got three cycles. Now, you may be wondering why this didn't go for any longer, and maybe I could have gotten four cycles. It's because the creatures got too good at surviving. If we take a look at the data itself, we can see that the storage and reproductive urge decreased over time, showing a preference of food over reproduction. We can also see a massive decline in size. This is probably the most conclusive evidence of the eventual extinction of the plants. Decreasing your size allows you to decrease your energy cost and be more efficient with resources. So when the plants started to increase again, the creatures were quick to take advantage of the plants. So before the plants could get to the carrying capacity, the creatures had already eaten all the plants. Now it's time to add a predator. For this, it was much harder and I never got a clear answer. Some runs were odd to say the least and others were just one cycle. I tried nerfing the predators, but that just made them too weak and making them more powerful just ruined the experience for the prey. However, there's a reasonable answer we can expect here. We can expect the plants to diverge from the prey and just have the predator and the prey interact while the plants are at maximum saturation. This is because, assuming ample food for the prey, the predators will eat the prey when too large, increasing the total number of plants. Then, the prey and the predators should assume predator-prey dynamic mentioned earlier until selective pressure selects for better species, after which an arms race will begin between the two species, or one will wipe out the other. 